let's get started. Uh, so today we're lucky to have Sandy Wynn with us, and she's the founder, founder of Coastal Communities Consulting, or as many of us know, CCC. Uh, and so in a little bit, we'll be hearing um, more from Sandy. Uh, this program is brought to you by our uh, BCC management team made up of myself, um, Maida, Rachel, and Gary. And so um, if there is any topic that you think would be appropriate for us to cover, please feel free to reach out to any of us um, listed here and we can bring it back to our group for uh, discussion for inclusion. Um, you know, this is sort of our disclaimer slide that we don't have any of the, all the answers or support any one particular adaptation or management strategy. We're here to have a conversation, um, start conversations, and um, you know, try to promote um, ideas, ways to uh, increase the visibility of the human dimension in terms of coastal land loss in Louisiana. These are our partners, Louisiana Folklore Society, the Center for Bayou Studies over at Nichols, Louisiana Folklife Program, the Wetlands Discovery Center, and the Center for Louisiana Studies at the University uh, or UL. Um, and of course, we could not do this program without the support of our funders that include the Louisiana Office of Cultural Development, BETNEP, the Barataria Terrible National Estuary Program, as well as the LEH, Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities, and the National Endowment for the Arts. So many thanks to um, our funders. And now um, I would like to pass the torch on to Maida to talk a little bit about the Passing It On workshops. You first. Uh, yeah, I'm very excited to say that we have more funds for this year uh, for more Passing It On workshops. We've been doing this since 2019. And over those years, we've spent more than $85,000 uh, going to, for tradition bearers. So very, very happy to be able to continue that. Workshops do need to be by June 30th. And if you know of anybody that may want to pass on their tradition, please have them contact me. Um, you, you can find my uh, contact information in the chat. Uh, I, we always like to spotlight someone. And so I'm going to spotlight Erlene Broussard and Kevin Rees, who did French singing back in 2022 at uh, Longfellow Evangeline State Park. Uh, several of the parks have been very supportive of this and provided facilities for these kinds of workshops. But I can help you figure out where, when, how. Um, if you just have an idea, give me a call or, or, um, or email me. So please call. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you so much for that. Um, so this is the uh, agenda for today. We're going to hear a little bit from uh, Sandy in a second. We'll have uh, some time for questions, answers, discussions with Sandy. We'll ask her what her hope for the coast is, and then we'll give you a little bit of an update on the position statement, as well as the working groups. Uh, we'll offer anyone who has any announcements that they would like to make, and then we invite everyone to stick around for the informal discussion um, that's pretty much, but you know, one o'clock, we usually end the formal part of the presentation and then um, we we keep talking to 1.30. So we hope you'll stick around. So with no further ado, today's talk is Coastal Communities Economy at a Loss. We're very excited to have Sandy Wynn with us, um, who again is the founder of CCC. Thank you so much for being with us, Sandy. Hi everyone, thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm, I'm Sandy Nguyen, I'm the Executive Director of Coastal Communities Consulting. Uh, we're really popularly more known for our three uh, letter logo. Uh, Coastal Communities Consulting seems to be a tongue twister and 80% uh, of my clients probably can't pronounce it. I'm very happy to be here to share um, some information. Hopefully you guys learned something today from what's going along uh, our coast. I uh, immigrated to the United States at six years old in 1979. Uh, my, my daddy was responsible for bringing uh, over 50 families uh, through the sea and, uh, and went through the whole immigrating process in 1979 and established ourselves in New Orleans East where a community of uh, Asian Americans were already established in New Orleans East. Uh, with that, 
my parents, you know, they tried the, you know, the ESL route, uh, you know, we, we, we began with public health and things like that. It just didn't work with five young kids. I was basically raised by my 10 year old brother. Uh, I was six, he was 10. And at a very early age, uh, my mom was started suckling oysters two shifts a day and daddy hopped on the boat right away. I think um, he ultimately became my pioneer, of course, uh, responsible for bringing uh, every friends he could find that came to the U.S. from across the states to to come um, live at our house for a couple of months before they got, they went out to sea. Uh, we all resettled in Louisiana due to the climate. The climate was a big issue in the fishing, where many of our Vietnamese families were able to start working right away. Um, back in the days, um, locating support and help uh, was very difficult. Uh, you would charge $50 an hour. At Those days were a lot of money. And so we couldn't do the food stamp or, or anything like that. Mom just went to work. And in between seasons, I remember mom would uh, pick cans, pop the cans for like a nickel. Uh, and that's how uh, basically I was raised uh, through school. So I came here and started kindergarten and went through the whole two-lane route and things like that. But at a very early age when uh, dad, because of the language issue, um, we're, we're having a very difficult time working offshore because uh, the language and just understanding, you know, rules and regulations. So uh, I had to start digging and diving deep into his business at the very early age of 14. And it started with translating and from dad to his friends and all the people he brought over, um, I just kind of built this database in my head full of knowledge about everything as every time I went to translate, I learned a new gig. And I think that was what was driving me, learning things every day, something new every day. And it's gotten me where I am. So um, by the time I graduated from Tulane, I had over thousands of clients that I already opened up businesses for, fisheries mainly, and then the grocery store came about, and then later on the seafood and the nail salon. So I think a more business oriented than anything, but mainly very dedicated to the commercial fishermen and even more dedicated when I opened my service wide open to the generational Americans along the coast after Katrina. And uh, that's when I found out that our service, my service and, and our service now at the CCC is needed by everyone along the coast, especially the small businesses. And when I talk about small businesses along the coast, I, uh, very specifically are involved with Fisher families, but keep in mind that along the coast, there are a lot of de fishery dependent businesses like the grocery stores, the gas station, all of which is, is pretty much under my, my belt as far as small businesses to service. And so my dad's been fishing all his life until he passed in 2018. And mama shuckle oysters two shifts a day. My brother would get one of those oysters check and that's how he kept us uh, fed throughout our lives, living in a Section 8 home in New Orleans East. And so when we talk about what's the issue today, um, today I actually come to you guys and with a very heavy heart. As our ship industry today, I, the unthinkable to me has happened is that the collapse. And uh, uh, right now the situation is so dire to where uh, this will probably be the first time I can ever say that it could be the most deadliest deadliest uh, winter season, the off season. And so there's a lot of things that are always impacting us, but just through the past decade, un unconventional things like COVID, the war, you know, and, and it kind of disrupted. I mean, it's, you know, our coast right now, our livelihood, our culture is at a standstill, it's, it's halted. And the mental health issue that's involved in it now is even scarier than the economic side. You know, and so what I want to, you know, when we talk about the coast, we got to talk about culture. Because at the CCC, I, I established the CCC in 2010. Uh, surprisingly, two white people from upstate New York helped me open up the CCC. Uh, it was the first time I ever got paid in my life. I've never charged uh, anyone for my service throughout my life. Um, but what it did, what it, it allowed uh, my service to be expanded 
farther out. And so the CCC was established in um, September of 2010 uh, as a direct result of the BP spill. That's five years after uh, Katrina, where I really felt that we fully kind of recovered and uh, bad luck, the oil spill happened right in front of the uh, beginning of the, the 2010 shrimp season. And so we talk about shrimp because shrimp is the uh, the most desired seafood in the nation. I think surveyed and 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 and, and researched, and um, it's not a stretch to say that the Vietnamese immigrant um, came over and pretty much revived the industry uh, in the early '80s. You know, we brought our knowledge over. We, we built boats. We we started our own business, and, and pretty much, you know made it really thriving for everyone. But we can't we can't forget the, you know, after I opened it up to the the coast, and you know, I found out that our generational fishermen, you know, for for decades, generations, they've been doing the same thing. It's a way of life for them, it's their culture. It you know, it it's 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 pretty much leave us alone, let us be. Um it's not a get rich business. But folks have been living comfortably, raising families along the coast for a very long time. Uh, and then now we, we, we're we having to deal with so much other impacts, right? And now it's not, it doesn't take a rocket genius to understand climate change. You know, a lot of our Vietnamese are like, why are we having a tornado 40 years in New Orleans East? How is Baton Rouge flooding? These are events that just just, you know, when we talk about climate change, it's very hard for me to translate it kind of like, but they get it. And not to mention that from being along the coast, they see everything, you know, it's, you know, they live and work on the water. So I don't think, I mean, I could be a little bit cocky when I say this, but I don't, you can put science all you want into the coast, but I don't think no one knows the coast more than our fisheries. I don't think no one is as resilient when you think about it. You know, adaptation is a daily phenomenon along the coast. But as there's the, the, so many other factors recently have gone come against us, especially the, the flood of imports. Uh, I think that is the, the, you know, that has been the the main key to where it allowed our, our domestic price to drop to, to, you know, my single word for this crisis right now is the prices of shrimps are inhumane. It's not low or unfair or at poverty level anymore. It's really inhumane, you know. Um, I think the mental toll is where I, I, I something that I cannot address, where I'm begging and really searching for help, uh, increase in domestic abuse, drugs, alcohol, no. Not, I had zero invite this May for graduation parties. Came September, a lot of the kids unexpectedly could not enter college because we didn't know that this May, again, we were not able to fish and ultimately had to dock. And so, when you talk about the environmental change, it impacts the, 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 the community along the coast in a sense now with the drought. It, you know, when we had to stop shrimping or fishing, we had to find an alternative income. And many of, us, many of us Asians went to farming, you know, buying a piece of land for $10,000, you know, producing these exotic fruits and vegetables and they actually can make that 10,000 back within one season of growing. But then when you think about factors like the drought, the salt water, nowhere in this world vegetable tastes better than the ones grown in Lower Blackman. I think the, the, the soil and, and the way they, they utilize their bycatch, believe it or not, uh, you know, the, 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 the fish, they don't throw fishes away that they, they, they catch in the net. They'll sort the shrimp out, but the fish, it's sort of like lapidone, kind of fermented, get, and it becomes really rich fertilizer. And so, the, you know, at the CCC, what we, we were doing, um, and the opportunity, you guys, were the fact that, you know, our fishermen have never thought ahead. Never at any time. You ask them after Katrina, what will happen if you can't fish? They would never think ahead. But with the diversion, the sole fear of these diversions have gotten a lot of our good, good fishermen to think ahead. And as we were doing formal adaptation now, going into families, we were interrupted by the COVID. 
But what that meant was for CCC to kind of help create a secondary income stream for our folks. And, and uh, quite frankly, a lot of it has come from them. We're just there to kind of advise where we where we know, uh, locate funding, and, and and work their way through navigating documentations and application where 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 it's needed. And this is what we do best in the office. Is what's most needed from all the fishermen and the coastal businesses along the coast. And so, the climate change, in addition to the war, bringing the the diesel at up to five dollars to where, uh, you know, we couldn't work. Uh, we thought that this year, coming this year, we never expected the shrimp to be, these are jumbo size shrimp that you guys are still buying at $9, $10 at the store here, $19, $20 up north, and it was at 80 cents. And, you know, diesel will level out, but at three eighty with diesel, it's just, so where it hurts us most and where we finally had to subdue to collapsing is the consecutive years, right? Every May, it is expected that we're going to make money. You know, with a, a half a million dollar vessel come November, you know, I would usually cut an average at least seventy, eighty thousand dollars $80,000. That's to carry us five months through the off season, our taxes and our annual pay. And if you do well, maybe ten, twenty thousand $20,000 back into savings. And so when you have consecutive years where we can't shrimp, you lose a year, you can pick it up the next year. All right. And so, um, I think a lot of it has to do with our federal governments for the past two decades, just continuously allowing the flood of imports to where every year it's gotten to this point. And so um, right now, uh, you know, just within the second month of the season, I, we had to go to three funerals. You know, one of our doc, a sweet man, sweet family, the oldest doc, you know, even committed suicide, couldn't keep up with his bill. And so when we don't work, our dock owners go down with us. Uh, so it, it's, it, it, it stretches beyond the fishermen and the business owners, right? Uh, it, it will eventually trickle up to the city area and eventually our whole uh, regional economy is going to be impacted if it's not already been, being impacted. So I think the visibility issue is, is huge. Climate change is real. Um, the thing about the fishermen is that we 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 can easily adapt, and everything has gone up in a sense. But if they just allow us to work, we can adapt around the issue of you know everything being you know extremely high, right? You know, you eat gourmet bread, you, you just go down to the normal bread. You cut down on certain issues, but when when it's something that we cannot control, like the price, resiliency just kind of end there, and adapt adaptation is is impossible. And so um, I'm very worried about this winter uh, for myself as well. But, you know, I uh, I deal with over two thousand clients in the office and come home to a disgruntled shopper. So. Um, I don't know where to go with this. I don't think help can come fast enough. I, I feel like after two decades, I've reviewed, we've done rallies, we protested, we've did everything we're supposed to do uh, at the state level and, and our communities here, as well as our association with our federal government. So um, I'm lost for words. I'm, I'm like, it's one of those things that is, does not feel good because I've always been able to kind of figure things out. Right. And so I'm well with I'm really here today to kind of seek help. Right. Just to just to get everybody to understand how important our coast is. Uh, because when you think about it, everything in Louisiana economically evolves from our coast. So I don't believe, I don't understand why we're not valued, we're not included, you know. There's no justice anywhere along our coast. But yet, when you think about it, our three top industry evolves and starts from our coast, the oil and gas, the ports, the seafood. And so, and when we talk about the families that are struggling now, the fact that I had to go, I went into a rouse and saw one of our fishermen from Lafitte. Mr. Malonso, what are you doing? 
Oh, Sammy, I'm just trying to decide if I should buy bread or eggs today. He, he, he I know what he meant. But I, I took this little story way up to the federal government's level. Eggs or bread? It shouldn't be that way. And while for, for us as immigrants, we view the United States as the most generous country in the world, the most humane country in the world, right? As we speak now, millions and millions of our dollars are going outside the country, saving other families. Whereas here, there's not enough visibility. No one understands about us. No one cares. Well, no one knows to care, right? Not to mention the, the texting. Text here for $15 to help the families of the earthquake somewhere in Morocco. But yet, we have families here that, that are quite frankly very important to our whole food system, right? And, and, and no one knows. I, I, don't think, uh, I don't think it's intentionally uh, I have to look at things both sides, right? You know, maybe our par parish government is not doing enough to promote us. Maybe it's the fishermen themselves I've seen that's always never open to change or not opening themselves up. Uh, why? Probably because they've been dis and dismissed by others and, and, and lawmakers all their lives. So, you know, and, and the best way for me to do it is just to stay in the middle and kind of educate and work on both sides of, of, of the situation. And so, uh, it, you know, the, you know the, ever since I had the CCC, we've accomplished a lot. A lot of our, my goals have been met through the CCC. It is a place that every one of you guys are welcome anytime to meet with real Fisher families, to, to learn and, 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 and hopefully help them, right? And so, Right now, there, there's just so much to talk about, so much issues to think about, so much uh, to tackle. But it's difficult to bring anything to, towards these families at this time because I think their mindset is not there. You know, and so um, I, I don't know what else to say or how we can make it work fast enough, but we're, we're, we're looking at a very dangerous off season, moving into 2024. Thank you very much for that, uh, Sandy. It, it, or, or, do we have any questions from um, the folks in the room for Sandy? Yes, Gary. <clears throat> Thanks for uh, telling us about that, Miss Sandy. It, it's e I think like like you were saying, I think it's easy for people just to not know about that problem at all. So I uh, appreciate you educating us about that. One of the things that we think about here and you touched on a little bit was the next generation. And like, I can tell that you're proud of the, um, of the industry that, that y'all have created in Plaquemines, but I, I wanted to get your feedback from, do you feel comfortable recruiting the next generation in into that business or do you feel like you're you're more apt to tell them well, maybe you should move up to higher ground and maybe you should not do this it's kind of an age-old question do you want your kids to do it, what you did or do you want them to do something else first of all there's always new interest in in the in, in the industry there's always, there's new immigrants coming over. I remember when Stockton, um, California, uh, their, uh, their whole economic crash, that city, a slew of young Cambodian immigrants uh, came from there and established. Um, in, the, in, our, in, our, in our coast, well, believe it or not, um, they, people help each other out. There's no, there's no friction between American fishermen or uh, and, and immigrant fishermen. If, if you heard that, that was all uh, not true. Uh, you you might have said there's always a little friction between the sports fishermen and the commercial fishermen. But ever since we've been here, we've been helped from day one from our American uh, friends. And so along our coast, commercial fishing is is something that they hurt and thrive the same way. And you're right. The 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 thing about it is what I found very early is that with the American generational fishermen, they want to pass it on. As for the immigrant fishermen, then that's the only difference here is that they don't want their son to even be near 
the boat. Thus, I have two older brother that just dad would like leave it alone for Sandy. I mean, I literally had to be on the boat for a whole month as the captain when my dad uh, was ticketed twenty five thousand for uh, because he didn't have citizenship. I didn't. I wasn't aware of that. But if you ask me. Of course, I want the industry to continue. I don't think that, I mean, I don't think that our shrimp can go any lower than we are today. It can only get better. I don't believe that the state will, will ever, uh, can, can they afford it? Or I don't, I don't know, but I don't think they'll ever allow us to continue to collapse. If there's somewhere or another, we will be back on our feet soon. Hopefully uh, this year, I don't think we can go another year without shrimping, but um, yes, I'm proud. Uh, they're the hardest working people, most knowledgeable people. They are my scientists. They're my environmentalists. They're everything to me uh, when it comes to it. So, yes, I'm proud. And, and, and the state should be proud. Um, we Nobody does it like we do, and nobody has the seafood that tastes as, as exquisite as, as, uh, as we here in Louisiana. And so there, there are way, there's there's like the pelagic longline fleet. We're that can be, that oh, that fleet right there is dying. They they're huge in our state, all out of Dubai. Uh, right now we're working with our environmental friends to try to get people to buy into that industry because the the bluefin tuna only spawns in the Gulf of Mexico. If you guys didn't know that, and so um. Yeah, we're doing a lot of programs and, and conservation efforts so, uh, uh, to, to save resources. And, and so, yeah, I, I would like to see it around for a long time. It's just it's just part of Louisiana. Thanks. If uh, anyone else has any questions, uh, please virtually raise your hand like Amy has done. So, um, Amy, please go ahead. Hi, Sandy. Good to see you. Um, I guess I wonder what can we do to be helpful? You said one of the reasons you're here is to ask for help and that had actually, I was going to ask this question anyway, like what would be helpful? You know, one of the things that I talk about a lot is the mental health, because it's not where I'm experienced. Um, I've seen after Katrina and after the spill where, you know, they send in, you know, Louisiana spirit and things like that. You know, how do you go to, to our coast where there's five different culture and, and, and tell these bold fishermen, you know, proud, proud bold fishermen that they need mental health, right? And then after when you do, uh, you know, if they're able to, to say something about it or, you know, calm down and collectively tell you that, yeah, maybe I'm a little stressed, um, how do you actually service them with the language issues, right? Um, my dream and my thoughts is this going to eventually happen because I know I can do this. It's just, you know, when we have meetings at our office, it's often three meetings in one day, one in Vietnamese, one in Cambodia, and one in, in English. And, you know, what I want is just to have a language access, you know, so, you know, a Cambodian doctor or, you know, just to come into office and do three big meetings and just to, to, to inform these folks that, hey, it's okay. You're dealing with, you're going through it, and it's okay to seek help. That's all I want. And I haven't been able to put that together, but given the, um, you know, Katrina, because the levee collapsed, because I, I feel like no one prepares and recovers faster or better than the commercial fishermen when it comes to storms. I'm never worried about that. I mean, it's amazing how they recover after every storm, and it's different every time, because I always... I'm always the last one out of these parishes and the first one back in. Now, the reason why I come back in very early is that first three days after a hurricane is where I see no racism, guys. That's where I just sit and absorb the way our coastal communities get together and pick back up. You even see Cajun Navy is driving around with a, with a Confederate flag, but they will never let an African-American lady fall to uh, off a boat. And so that's the reason why, no reason why I'm always the first. And then my clients look for me uh, after every disaster. But where I need the most help is where, how do we um, we deal with this, this this mental health issue? Because it impacts their entire family and the entire family. Um, I can tell you now, my husband drinks till four or five in the morning, snappy all day long. Generational Lafitte fishermen, um, Friends in Homer, you know, come in the office, red eye, red eye, scared of blink. And so the, that is something that 
and you know, all I can do is just kind of just listen. Uh, I don't, I don't, I don't feel enough confident in that area. So that's where we need the most help. And it seems like uh, no one has dared to tackle it or don't know how. And I don't, I don't blame them. That's number one. Number two is I do these kind of talks and and I've, I've established myself with working with government more now too because I used to never deal with them. Is that I've, I've developed a lot of good friends uh, um, that works for the government, leaves the government, but they always have us in the back of their minds, wherever mm -hmm. they go. Uh, and, and and so that's what we need, right? We, we need folks to say that, you know, we're coming to Louisiana and we're gonna eat at this restaurant, but we, we know where this shrimp come from, mm -hmm. right? And so um, that's why I want, I need you guys to help. Just kind of always think about, and you guys live along the coast. You can feel that the bars are empty tonight, these days, right? You can feel that all the little, you know, small businesses that are dependent on us. When the fishery goes down in Chalmet, in Homa, in Cutup, in New Orleans East, in Harvey, everything kinds of kind of go down. And you you can pretty much, um, you know, follow these things, uh, from the job loss and the business closure too. So I'm very aware of all of this too. And so, you know, just kind of, you know, I'm trying to educate as much as I can and just to have folks that maybe don't live in your area like you and Jonathan and working, but, you know, just uh, kind of always be thinking, you know, this is what Louisiana is all about and that these families should be the first thought of, you know, at, at, at all levels. I would love to talk to you more about um, I'll get in touch with you. I'd love to talk to you more about the mental health piece. Thank you, Amy. Thanks for your question, Amy. And please stick around um, after one o'clock for the informal session. We can carry on that uh, conversation. Uh, Shauna, yes, you have your hand up. Hi, Sandy. Thank you for your presentation. It was it was uh, it was great to have you here. I appreciate you taking the time to do it. So you mentioned about the restaurants, and of course, I think there's a new law saying that the restaurants in New Orleans have to, or maybe it's statewide, have to let you know where the shrimp comes from. But I read recently, and you'll have, you'll learn more that, that, that they caught a whole bunch of restaurants lying. And why is this so hard to enforce? Um, and, uh, you know, is there some way that you know, is there some place where people could do something around this, this enforcing of, because I think a lot of restaurants are lying about where the shrimp come from. Yeah, they do. Um, I think mean, this, this law has been out for, for, for three, four years now. Yes. Uh, originally the fines was like 50 bucks, um, but enforcing it, I think that the state doesn't really have a, a, a true system on who's in charge of enforcing it back then. And I and now that we're collapsed and we're rallying and there's more, uh, uh, you know, attention towards the issue that they, they bumped up the fines, so uh, I think $1,000 now, uh, but still I haven't That's still seen nothing. no real traction regarding uh, you know, the fines, the penalties, no no coverage or, or anything known about it. I have yet to see a restaurant one that really got fined, uh, unless somebody in the in the audience here have, but it's sad, but it's, you know, my thoughts are, you know, I should, we should just ban imports from the state, but I know there's, that's not going to ever happen with, you know, all the, the big businesses, but, you know, I would, I would tend to think that's the, 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 the best way so that folks that really come here for the seafood know that 100% they will get Louisiana seafood. But quite frankly, a lot of our tourists, they don't they they, they don't know that they just assume it's, it's got seafood. You know, even the people that live here locally um, pretty much can't tell. So mm, it's it's all about regulation and, and just, you know, helping and figuring things out. It's tough. Thank you for Thank you for your question, Shona. Um, Sandy, are there any other programs like the one that Shona mentioned that are working to help the commercial fishermen? And I think of, you know, there's the the farm bill that gets passed and, and there's money that the government pays to farmers to be able to subsidize their ability to do what they do. Is there 
you know, is there a way maybe that we can get our commercial fishing industry to participate in that farm bill? Because it feels like that might be a way to get some of that subsidized so that way our, our commercial fishermen won't be in the place where they are now? Here's the thing, guys. It's, just, it's this simple. There is, you know, decades of long law that shrimpers, crabbers, and now finfish are not considered under USDA farm. We're not farmers. The only people that can benefit from that are the oysters who farm, you know, who sees their own oysters. And so all the benefits that that we could reap like the farmers do under the USDA, we are not allowed. We 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 will not qualify. Is there 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 there's been arguments and 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 fighting over that in Congress for for many years. It's just not going to happen. So you don't see that as a path forward to being able to support the fishermen. No, many we thought about this many years ago, decades ago. It's just not going to. It's the law. We we are not farmers. Sure. We 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 catch our. I, uh, we harvest uh, wild caught. So uh, yeah. under the law, the United States law is that we're not considered farmers. So a lot of it, we we cannot um, participate or qualify for. Are there John any other- Jonathan, uh, Kimberly Chauvin has- Yeah, I see, mate. Yeah. yeah, she has some comments directly related to this. She's contacted okay. me separately and some news She's really about good. This. She's a really good okay. resource, Kimberly. Yeah, uh, Kim, go ahead. Okay, there she is. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. All right. So on the restaurant bill, uh, we are working on a number of things. The problem was was that LDH <clears throat> had it wasn't on the critical violations list, even though they had twenty six hundred that they had caught. There were no fines given out. The fine was like twenty five dollars. That's the cost of doing business. Um, what we're going after right now is different fines, and it is going to be that um, uh, within that, like they could paper clip import to the menu. But so that was in 2019. So now we want to take that part out of it because we've had ample time to follow the law since 2019. The other part of it has to do with. Um, LDH doesn't have as much teeth as evidently we thought they did at that particular time. But last year, what they did was they put it on the critical violation list. So we're going to ask for those who have been caught and if a fine was assessed, where the fine money went, what are they doing with it, or um, to know, I think they have 170 sanitation workers that check restaurants, prisons, um, in, in different entities, but in that law, so the law is a health bill, okay? The health bill came because the WHO in 2019 stated that you can become antibiotic resistant by eating imported shrimp and fish, okay? That's nowhere out there in, in people's minds. Like, they, they have not been given that information. But even when you go to a restaurant, and I've had some in homeless, that I know that I specifically spoke to and said, this is the law. Still not putting on their, their menu. And so, you you know, I, so I know where you go to turn them in. But let's say I'm in Bossier City. Who do I call? Most people do not know which sanitation department to call. They just think, uh, they're just like, okay, well, we didn't know what to do with it. So that's about to change. Uh, we are making probably a Google website to get out to people to know which parish has which cities and different things where you can call into. So we're going we're gonna to go ahead and do something like that. So that's the restaurant part of it. It is coming to pass. We have brought it up to the attention of Jeff Landry, um, that is going to get newly elected governor uh, in, in that thing. And so there has to be a happy, uh, like a, uh, a happy, meeting in between, but my thing is, this is what I asked them, I said, okay, so how much does a stay at the hospital cost, how much does it cost of Medicaid, how much does it cost us in the healthcare system by allowing these people to continually eat that stuff, what is, what's the cost of to the state compared to 
getting this out to the people to get them off. Great. So that was a big eye opener for some of the senators. Um, but it's really hard when LRA is lobbying so hard and they put a lot of money into our state legislation. I mean, all you have to do is go look at the campaign contributions and you will see what, you know, it, it's there, plain and simple. So that's the restaurant part. I mean, you got into the program. So the form bill has to the Department of Agriculture. Fisheries, which is in the Department of Commerce, there are no programs. Even when the disaster money comes out, it is an absolute mess. Because what they do there is it goes to NOAA. You have to submit a plan. It's ridiculous. We all do trip tickets. They have all the data that they need. You're making us go. So a 2019 disaster is just getting out in 2023. It hasn't been distributed because we had to submit a plan to NOAA. NOAA didn't have to okay it. There were a few things they might not like. Then you have to send them in again. Then it goes to Gulf State for Fisheries, who does nothing with it, by the way, except take their three to five percent. Then it goes to wildlife and fisheries, three to five percent. Then it goes to staff and planning. It is, and, and I'm telling you, three to five percent because I don't know whether it's three or five percent. So that they take. So by the time all this money gets down here, no one took their percentage. Golf no State three took their percentage. Wildlife and fisheries is taking their percentage. And here at South and South and planning. And I don't know if any of you looked at South and planning, who is hiring people with a high school diploma. No fisheries experience, 